Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to another episode of season 4. I am Jack joined by Mr. Solis. Alright so we are back. Uh, obviously next week is fast lane, so we are covering something different this week but before we get into that. Sir how have you been since the last time we talked? I've been fine Jack. Happy October. We were just talking about you know we in that think of the semester for both you and me it's been busy but i'm grateful for the good weather and my help yeah it's very busy i'm glad to hear that you sir are doing well and just like you mentioned you know getting right into it uh i can't remember at what point we were the last time uh, i talked when on the podcast with uh Gio and Don, but you know, we're at like that sort of like week six or seven mark, you know, so we're like yeah. we're getting right into the middle of it, you know, and uh, it's been pretty fine, been keeping up well with my classes, you know. Do you get a, I don't know what your schedule is like, but do you get an extra day this weekend more than maybe you originally expected? Uh, no, because the school is closed Friday. And Monday for Indigenous Peoples Day. Hmm. No, I haven't heard anything about that, so I don't well, think we, so. I could not be more grateful, and I'm excited about what they're calling fall break. Hmm. Yeah, well, uh, technically last week I had a bit of a break because uh, two of my classes, uh, the professors had to like cancel at the last minute. Okay, I got you. So I, I got somewhat of a break, but, you know, it isn't... Was it because they didn't get there in 15 minutes? You know, if they, they don't get to the class in 15 minutes, you can just leave. No, uh, I'm, for, or, I'm glad but, you're laughing. I'm glad you heard the joke that was said. That it was implied there. Uh, but, yeah, no, uh, I, I forgot what the reason was, but I know one of them just... Uh, I think it was like... Uh, I think he explained to us that uh, he didn't have uh, child care available to him. Yeah, I saw this other Instagram meme, which was like high school. College is really, really hard. I'm getting you ready for the all the rigors and strains of college. And it was like college. Hey, everyone. I didn't feel like getting up today, so we're going to cancel class. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I already had uh, one of my friends. He, uh, he accidentally slept in, so he ended up missing class one day. Goodness. So it begins. Yeah, so it begins. But uh, other than that, school has been pretty fine. And uh, Great. I'm ready for uh, to just stay consistent with it. Mm-hmm. You and me both with our respective responsibilities. Yeah. But getting uh, into the podcast itself... Obviously, like I mentioned, WWE Fastlane isn't until next week. So why are Mr. Solis and I here? Well, it is because AEW held their Wrestle Dream pay-per-view. In their first annual, a promise of more to come in, in, in future years. Yeah, and until that Max, uh, that HBO Max deal gets announced, everyone's wallets cry. <laughs> Yeah, but you know what? I uh, was, uh, you know, I, I celebrate AEW's success. I'm glad they're getting the response they want. I wonder how long it's going to last. You know what I mean? Mm. I've been bought in. I'm buying them. How long am I going to buy them? You only got so many dream matches you can put on that these cards. You know what I mean? Yeah. And after that, that's when you really have to start relying on, um, you know, the story building, you know, and how to make matches we've already seen more interesting the next time around, you know. You mean they're going to have to devote uh, more than a week to a story, you say, Jack? <laughs> What's that? They have to devote more than one match on the card to the women? Yeah, there's only so much TV time, you know what I mean? <laughs> Oh man, but yeah, definitely was excited for a lot of the ones in this one. There's especially one particular. Well, 
there was multiple matches, but there was one I was very interested in solely because it's something that AEW doesn't do very often that we'll get into it later. Ooh, can I guess which one it is? Sure. Is it Hangman? It is. Oh my. I can't wait. <laughs> Did you watch the Zero Hour? I tried to catch uh, some of it, but at the time that it was airing, I wasn't uh, home. We were actually out, so I was like watching on my phone. I caught, yeah. um, I think I the, the match I caught the most was Claudio versus Josh Barnett. Uh, that was the only one I was... That and Luchasaurus versus uh, Nick Wayne. That was the one that I was the most excited about. It was announced the day before. I was in line at Universal Horror Nights with my nephew when I saw it. I'm like, oh, oh. I didn't even know Zero Hour. I'm grateful I was watching. Yeah. Uh, what'd you think of those matches, sir? Uh, when it comes to Casagnoli and Barnett, uh, you know, they put on a good show. Um... It's one of those, like, it was all, like, a tribute to Anoki. The whole night's a tribute to Anoki. So, like, it's catch as catch can. Some people are into it. Some people are not. But I'm sure everybody was into the best part of the match. John Moxley's commentary. <laughs> yeah, Moxley had me dying on commentary. He was so funny to listen to. Yeah, he really was. Yeah. And a good friend of Barnett, right? So, you know, he was really good. He knows his, He knows what needs to happen. And he was bigging up both guys, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that um, was a fun match. Yeah. Um, moving on to the main card. We opened, the night. we opened the night with uh, MJF defending the Ring of Honor tag titles against the righteous uh, Vincent and Dutch in a handicap match because Adam Cole went and got himself in. I'll say this. "Quote unquote injured because we still don't know the the if we're getting worked or not, you know." Yeah, we don't. I mean, he's he's been injured like a lot, so like I'm very quick to believe it, right? Yeah. We saw MJF, somebody in an MJF devil mask beat up Jay White, who was small in stature. <laughs> yeah. So I'm especially like. Uh, weary on. I I fully believe he likely did injure himself, but I think maybe they're leading people on in the sense of trying to make them think it's a more severe, longer time out injury than it actually didn't is. Didn't he say his his ankle exploded? <laughs> I think that was his wording. Yeah, I don't know. Who knows? But yeah, so MGF's here defending the Ring of Honor tag titles in a handicap match. Um, it's been like a, a short sort of build, as we've come to expect. But, you know, the Righteous, you know, used their time best to, like, kind of uh, set a story with MJF. Despite, you know, they're not really being a story, like, put in place. Like, everyone kind of looked at this as, like, filler in a sense, you know. Especially with Adam Cole going down with injury. But, you know, they did their... They utilized their time best to get people interested with, like... Their vignettes where, you know, they're calling Adam Cole the liar, you know, and, you know, they're really trying to get MJF to realize that, you know. Mm. Jack, my heart sank at the realization that MJF was going to beat this tag team. You know what I mean? Like, the writing was on the wall. Uh, it gets worse as the match progresses, but, like, you, you think he's going to keep these titles until Adam Cole reveals, you know, he's healthy or he's lying right and i go i don't like the righteous like i would have liked them 10 years ago you know it's 2023 and it's uh i mean i think like it's just it's just too similar to things that were better you know what i mean yeah i get but you. I, don't, I still don't think they deserve what they were gonna get in this match <laughs> yeah i saw a lot of people feel the same way i mean I'm right there with you. I remember when uh, they showed up at the Ring of Honor show back in L.A. And I was just like, yes. who are these people? I've heard nothing about them. You know, so it's like, I can't say I'm a fan of them. But, you know, I'm still a guy that's like, you know, very uh, what people would label old school, I guess. In the thinking of like, a tag team shouldn't be losing to a solo guy. Especially a defined tag team that's been together for 
you know, years at this point. It's like, why are, they, why are these established teams losing to either two solo guys or, in the case of this match, one solo guy who the only reason he's not on the losing end of this match is because he's the world champion. Which raises different issues altogether. Um, but um, so I guess MJF's doing this thing where he's going to call his shot. And I get the sense from that Samoa Joe match that he had uh, last week or the week before, right? He says, I'm going to choke you up. And he choked him out. And, like, he won technically um, keeping his word, right? Yeah. Comes out. He calls his shot. He says he's going to body slam Dutch, a giant man. And he's going to shove Vincent's face and his braids up Dutch's you know, backside. <laughs> and the crowd, I tell you what, the crowd are having themselves a good old time. That's exactly what they wanted to see. That's exactly what they were waiting for. This match, Jack, had a very clear story. <laughs> yeah, very much so, you know. And uh, I saw a lot of people essentially upset with that whole, uh, you know, what what they did with uh, Vincent and Dutch and... Uh, I found the the discourse around it very interesting because a lot of people were quick to say they were buried and other people were quick to say that, like, they can recover, you know, depending on how they're booked after this. But, like, I don't don't know. It's kind of tough to, uh, especially when you look at what their characters are supposed to be. Yeah. You know, and especially, like, the whole intimidation factor behind their sort of, like, cult vibe. It's kind of hard to take that a bit more seriously when you just saw, you know, a guy getting his head shoved up the other guys, you know what. They got, and now I realize, I don't know why I thought it was a one-time thing. It's not a one-time thing, Jack. He's going to kangaroo kick, like, the entire Ring of Honor tag team division. I, you know, you know how they say that Cody Rhodes was a big Triple H fan, like, secretly? Yeah. I wonder how big a fan MJF was of Triple H from the early 2000s into 2010 because it seems like he's following that model of burying an entire tag team division. <laughs> I've seen people also compare him to like Hogan in the sense like he's getting he's getting over these like like uh, basic moves, you know, like the clothesline or the drop. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's. A better comparison than I even thought it was at the beginning of your thought. Um, but, you know, MJF retains the titles here. Um, and keeps his word. Body slams Dutch, does the butt thing, and even threw in a kangaroo kick to the crowd's delight. Mm. Maddening. <laughs> Maddening. But it gets the crowd, you know, to start off the show hot and... uh they move right into a match that will keep the crowd on their feet as we got Eddie Kingston facing off against Katsuri Shibata. For Eddie's Ring of Honor World Championship and his New Japan uh, Strong Championship. I love that commentary made the distinction that this is not for Shibata's pure championship because that would necessitate an entirely different set of rules that they were not abiding by. And Eddie was already like four rope breaks into the match. And they were like, yeah, good thing this wasn't for the pure championship. He'd be in real trouble. Yeah, definitely. And uh, it's interesting to see how this match came to be, especially because the rumors were it was originally going to be Moxley and Eddie's place. Interesting. And, you know, obviously now Moxley's better from the injury scare that he had in his match against uh, Ray Phoenix. But, uh, you know, I hope people don't think this is a bit mean of me to say, but, you know, as much as I love Moxley, I'm a bit more glad that this is the match we got. Absolutely. I'm happy for myself, for you, and for Eddie Kingston. It's like, you know, I think having... Like the run of his life. Yeah. Been having a lot of fun wrestling different guys, doing different things. And, you know, getting to see, getting to see him uh, wrestle Shibata was definitely hey, a fun one. How about the commentary line that he, he himself, Eddie, is an All Japan guy. So to have this guy who champions All Japan and the King's Road, right, against New Japan's, like, uh, uh, what do they call it? Like a pillar, right? It's, yeah. Something special. Oh, and then 
goodness, it's my favorite kind of match, right? To like chop until your chest is pink and Shibata's like, keep going. You guys, that all you got? You know? Oh, I love the promo, Jack, where he's using Siri to translate for himself. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, th- this match was great. All as always, stiff, you know. And uh, yeah, I'm really glad that uh, AEW has been using Shibata a lot, both in Ring of Honor and in yeah. AEW. You know, especially because uh, it's very clear that uh, when it comes to the Shibata situation in New Japan, they very much treat him like how uh, WWE were very cautious with. Uh, um, Daniel Bryan. Bryan. Yeah, with Daniel Bryan, you know, how they just didn't want to, you know, clear him. And when he was cleared, like, they were kind of very cautious with how they used him. And it's like, you very much saw the same thing with New Japan where they were like, we'll bring you back and let you wrestle, but we ain't letting you go, like, all out, all out. And then now Listen, it's like in AEW. Here's Red Narita, right? <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Eddie Kingston go, you know, suplexing him. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, it is cool to see him being used in AEW to, you know, a fuller extent, you know. And it's cool to see that, you know, he's changed up his style a bit to where he can still do that stuff. But, you know, does it less to preserve his health, you know? Yeah, yeah. Less is more for the long run, for sure, right? Yeah. And give the guy a break. His brain was taken out of his head. (laughs) (laughs) What's up? It's a long-standing um, urban myth that Dave, what's his name, believe like wholeheartedly. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. But uh, Eddie retains in a good match. Great match with him and Shibata. Uh, yeah, and I love that. Like you know, because the two have such similar styles. What did it take to beat Shibata? A big old power bomb, right? Yeah. Like a big, like a big, like. Uh, big grapple move yeah so real good match there uh excited to see more of eddie's uh world title run you know especially because we've been clamoring for it for you know a while especially on that ring of honor show where all of us were ready to see him win it there yes and um his he's gonna defend the strong Open weight championship. I, I don't know if it's next, but he's going to defend it in Las Vegas at the end of October against Henare. Mm. That should be a good one. Absolutely. I think picking up and closing the loop on their um, sort of ongoing feud during the G1. Mm, that should be good. But uh, after that match, I believe was... Was it the women's match or the tag title? Not the tag title match, but the 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 four way tag match. I'm trying. According to, to the Bleacher Report, I suspect it was Chris Statlander versus Julia Hart for Chris Statlander's TBS Championship. All right, that's what I remember. So yeah, this one, uh, I was very interested to see how this one played out, especially because uh, uh, I saw a lot online that a lot of people were, you know, talking up how. Uh, Julia Hart has really improved, you know, uh, like in ring wise. And uh, a lot of people were very impressed with the the vignettes that they were doing for her and like the package yeah. they were doing for her. And then obviously Chris Statlander has been, you know, a good TBS champion, um, been having some great matches. So a lot of people were excited for this one. I am going to be an equal opportunity critic when it comes to Julia Hart's presentation uh, as I said with the righteous, it's funny and it's awkward and it's like, you know, I think we've seen a lot of it very recently. Spooky nonsense, you know? Yeah. And on top of that, Jack, I wonder if you had the same feeling I did. Watching her have this match, watching her come up with Brody King and no one else, I was like, I don't know if the other guys are hurt, but this has a lot of like Alexa Bliss vibes where it's like, I like this because of the fiend, and I can't help but notice he's gone. <laughs> yeah, I don't know too much about what's happening with the other House of Black, uh, but uh, members. But I know a lot of people like the pairing of uh, Brody King and Julia Hart. Uh, mm. I mean, I like Brody King, so I know, do too. I wish we saw a lot more of them, which is going to be a point I'll expand upon with 
the Hangman match. But, you know, I, I, I can understand that thinking, too, when it comes to Julio Hart, where it's like, you know, it, it's kind of tough at this point in wrestling because it's like almost everything's been done. It's kind of tough to put a unique spin on things. But also, you know, people have found their ways, you know. Yeah. And I'll tell you what. Um, I was quite impressed with this match. How about you? I was too. I really, I've really been uh, enjoying Chris Statlander's run uh, with this TBS championship. Uh, I will say, and it's likely due to the way Tony Khan books his women's division, I was a bit confused that people thinking that uh, she potentially could have lost the title here. Like, maybe I could see mm. why, but like, a part of me was like, I don't know, nothing in this feud has shown me that, like, you know, Statlander was losing, you know, like, I, I, like, I get Julia's built up a lot of momentum heading into this match, but... The momentum, Jack, it's a 28-match win streak. I don't know who she's been beating, but 28 matches, Jack. Yeah, so I can understand maybe that, that, like, the momentum is there, but, you know... I, I don't know. To me, like it just didn't seem like it. Like there, like there was no doubt in my mind that Statlander was winning this match. You know, got it. I did think uh, the the point in the match where she uh, slapped the mist out of her mouth. I thought that was pretty funny. That was pretty good. Yeah, glad commentary called it out. Unless you saw the dribbles of it on the floor, I think one might have missed <laughs> it. <laughs> hit the spot. <laughs> uh, but uh, overall, I thought it was a good match. I agree. Yeah, I'm excited to see more of Statlander. Um, moving on now is the four-way tag match with a tag title opportunity on the line. The interesting thing that people took away from this was that it says AEW tag title shot anytime. So it's not oh. just, you know, they're the next challengers. It says anytime. So people found that interesting. But the competitors... For this four-way match, you got the Lucha Brothers, Penta, and Phoenix. You got Orange Cassidy and Hook teaming together. You got the Guns, Colton, and Austin. And then you got the Young Bucks, Matt, and Nick Jackson. Heading in, did you have a favorite? Uh, I'm going to be honest. I, I personally didn't really want any of these teams to win. Because <laughs> in my eyes, I was like, if FTR is retaining, yep. I don't want to see them against the Young Bucks because we've gotten three oh. matches from them. Mm-hmm. I don't really want to see them against the Guns because we got that at the start of this year. Interesting. Orange Cassidy and Hook might be, like, the most interesting option just to see how those two would play off against those two. But even then, yeah. I was like, there's not really much, like, substance there in my eyes. Right. And after... The matches they had in 2021, I definitely didn't want to see the Lucha Brothers face off against FTR. So I was like, I don't want to see any of these teams. But then my mind started thinking, well, maybe Aussie Open is winning the titles later in the show. And that opens the door for any of these guys to be new challengers. Thus, in my eyes, I was like, "Eh, it might be the Lucha Brothers or the Young Bucks in this sense. Like in terms of like who I would think was winning at that point. Yeah, for me, we got Bucks holding Ring of Honor trios tag titles, and you've got Ray Phoenix holding the international titles. So automatically, I don't want them anywhere near a different title picture, you know? Yeah. So I'm going for the guns in this affair. Yeah, I will say, uh, no offense to the guns, but, uh, uh, well, actually, it it would be tough to do it, especially because, like, they already feuded with them, but, like, a lot of people really wanted uh, Jay White and Ricky Starks to, you know, be involved in the tag title scene. But obviously, we're seeing Jay White involved in the world title scene. So that's a bit more of an upgrade. But, yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely could have seen the guns winning. But, yeah, like I said, I was just a bit confused at what direction they were going to go. Given that FTR has faced three out of the four teams in this match multiple times already, you know. And yeah, that goes back I to. Agree. That goes back to the point you were saying at the beginning where it's like you only got so many dream matches and you only got so many matchups you can do before you got to like really start putting in the work to make them interesting. So since this match is a a spot fest, 
I think, compared to the matches we've seen so far. What spot stood out to you, Jack? Um, let me think. Um, I will say the spot that, like, stood out to me just because of, like, how the rest of the match played out was the whole Ray Phoenix injury angle where yeah. I wonder if he actually was injured or because he's international champion and they just had the injury scare with Mox, they don't want their inter- their international champion potentially getting hurt, so they take him out the match. But then that begs the question, why is he involved in the match to begin with? You know? <laughs> yeah, that was an interesting spot, and I love the guns, like, jumping on him. You know what I mean? Jumping on him. I think, what did they do? Oh, they threw Penta in, and it led to my spot of the night, or match, where they tagged themselves in. Now, because of the nature of the four-way tag, both guns are in the match, and one tries to pin the other, but the referee, he's not no Rick Knox. He's got he's got a conviction. He goes, I'm not counting this. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that spot, too. Um, I'm trying to remember, like, some different, like, spots throughout the match. Um I, I, I wish we saw a bit more of Hook. Like, it's something that people bring up. It's like, when it comes to singles matches, we never see more than 10 minutes of Hook. When it comes Very to true. the tag match, we didn't see much of him. There was the big spot where uh, him and uh, one of the Young Bucks were trading, uh, oh, I forget what type of suplex they call it. Yes. But they were trading suplexes back and forth. I didn't need that, Jack. Like, I got this real sense that Matt Jackson's like, hey, and let's like, I don't know, man. I didn't, I didn't, Matt Jackson's really going out of his way to show I could do that stuff too. And you're like, ew, this has got try hard, like <laughs> all over it. Yeah. Um, I can't remember too many spots after that, but yeah, it, to me, it wasn't uh, the highlight of the night in my sense, you know. It was fairly good, but uh, the Young Bucks come out on top, ready for a fourth match with FTR. Yep. Yeah, and it's very interesting to see how this one goes. A lot of people think it's going to happen at Full Gear since it's in Los Angeles. The Young mm. Bucks are from this area and all that. The Young Bucks are from this area, yet I'm pretty sure Inglewood is like uh, a drive away from Rancho Cucamonga. Yeah, it's true. But people would look at it as, oh, well, it's their home state at the very least. Yeah. But could be interesting, but I really don't know where it all goes. And uh, personally speaking, I know people have different opinions, but personally speaking, I'm not really too interested in that fourth match or a potential Young Bucks title tag title reign, especially not when they have the six man titles where they could just do whatever they're gonna do with the tag titles there with the six man belts. Some I read, maybe I don't know if you said it, I don't know if I heard somebody else say it, but like they made this clear distinction between FTR and the Young Bucks, and they said FTR have tag matches, they tag, and they're like, you know what I mean, like they're having a tag match, Young Bucks just are going to do all the things that they were always going to do. And I don't know. There's something about Young Bucks. Like, they're not cutting promos. They're not... I don't know. There's no... I mean, the motivation's the title. They're just... (laughs) Yeah, I I get that. Who are they? (laughs) I get that sentiment. But yeah, I don't know. Me personally, I'm I'm not too interested in it. Uh, I want to see a bit more variety. You know? Yeah! Which, getting into our next match, this is a perfect segue into it. We have, in his hometown of Seattle, Swerve Strickland facing off against Hangman Adam Page. This, I was excited about as well. The moment they set this up, I instantly said, you can take all my money in Uh. my bank account. Inject this into my veins, please. I need this match. I need this feud more than anything, you know? And, you know, getting into it right before the match, since we have some time on this episode, the reason I love it so much is because it's two top guys going against each other without the fear of, oh, we both these guys can't lose. It's, It's saying, throw them both against each other. Whoever loses, that's up to us to figure out how we, you know, 
build upon that loss afterwards, you know? Yes. I think and I tell you what, what Jack, thinking about uh, what we said before about MJF, the AEW heavyweight champion floundering in this weird tag team sort of trajectory, if you're like, who can stand to uh, challenge him, right? I looked at this match, Jack, and said, hey, whoever wins this one, I wouldn't mind either guy stepping up to MJF. Yeah. And, you know, I feel the same way where it's like, to me, you know, especially like uh, looking at the work at the beginning of the year, how much Moxley did to get people invested in Hangman again to rebuild him, you know, I was looking at it like, you know, uh, maybe later on in the feud, because it was still a bit too early into MGS feud, uh, like towards like this summertime or like now in the fall time, you know. Hangman could truly be a great foil to MJF's reign right now. You know, like he can really be mm-hmm. a good sort of contrast of like this is AEW's pure baby face. You know that the fans truly love. They get yeah. behind him. You know to go against heel MJF. Now, obviously, that's a bit tougher now with MJF being like a tweener where he's like baby face of Adam Cole, but heel against everyone else. You know. But, like, I thought that would be an interesting contrast. And now, with him leaning towards that babyface side, we can now see him go up against a certified heel in Swerve Strickland, you know? Hey, it's interesting you bring up that heel-face dynamic because we are in Seattle, Washington. Everybody in the building wants us to chant for Swerve the heel, and they let him know that they want nothing to do with Hangman, the guy who's trying to beat their hometown guy. Yeah, and I love how Hangman instantly, like, he recognized it and switched it up and started playing into a lot of the heel antics, you know? And commentary picked up on that and said that he's it's going to be to his detriment that he responds to the audience, that he's so preoccupied with the audience. Yeah, definitely. You know, and um, what resulted to me was an absolutely phenomenal match, match of the year contender, even in my opinion. I really enjoyed this match. Dang, I I thoroughly enjoyed it. I yeah, and uh, there was definitely a moment in the match where it went from "Hey, this is a pretty good match" to "Oh, this is a really good match." Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, Hangman got his usual spots in, like the moon saw and off, and and like the moon saw off the top rope to the floor. You know, yep. um, I will say uh, the one uh, great spot that, like, you know. It's really tough for Swerve to, like, do it at times and make it look uh, effective when he does the stomp. Because I think to, like, moments, like, when they won the tag titles, when him and Keith Lee won the tag titles like, yeah. last year. And, like, yeah. you, you go back and watch it, and, like, it's part of the camera work's fault, too. But, like, you see him hit yeah. that stomp on Ricky, and he clearly does it. Like, he literally, he clearly splits his legs and stomps the ground next to Ricky's yeah. head. But on this one, when he does it to Hangman, who's, like, laying on the ring apron after he was working his arm, when he does it there, it really looks brutal, you know? And uh, freaking Prince Nana, as soon as he does it, you just, like, the camera, I'm glad the camera didn't choose to, like, focus on him. You just see him in the background start hitting the dance after after Swerve hits the, the foot stomp. And I thought it was hilarious that, like, you don't fully see him, but you just see a glimpse of him in the background just hitting the dance. That's funny. Um... There's a story throughout the match that Hangman was targeting Swerve's hand. And to what you said about the camera angle, right? There's one angle that knocks like a quarter of a star off of me where Hangman's like pounding on his hand. But he's not pounding on his hand. He's pounding on the mat next to his hand. And I'm like, bro. <laughs> and I'm like, why also isn't he just pounding on his hand? Like, <laughs> Yeah. Um... That's a weird choice, but like... Um, I hear you. I mean, foot stops, I think, like, are real hit and miss. Pun all the way intended. But that foot stomp that made me go, oh, oh, this needs to be on a list? This match needs to be on a list? Is the foot stomp after the arm break. That arm break, Jack, I don't know how they make that sound. That, like, you know, that, like, he's going to break his arm. Uh, Penta used to do it, right? Yeah. That snap. I don't know how they made that snap sound. The one that got the doctors looking at him. Yeah. And we're like, oh, this was bad. And Swerve's like, we're not done. Stomp on the apron. That was incredible. 
Yeah, I really love that spot. Um, I love the way that uh, um, they were doing the stuff like on the steps and then Hangman hits the dead eye on the steps. That was real great. Um, and then, uh, you know, he, he for, you know, watching his matches, he, he doesn't do it as often anymore. But I was very uh, pleasantly surprised with uh, the JML driver being the finish to this match. Yeah, you know it's it's coupled with um, the 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 crown spot, right? Like yeah. Vince Nana, who I didn't know a lot about, but now I'm all about. <laughs> he's such a great like. He's just so great at that role, you know. Yeah, but uh, he does the oldest. No, he's like getting thrown out. Oh, because he put his foot on the rope. Yeah, hang that could have won. Prince Nana is an incredible, uh, uh, you know, corner man. He's going to get thrown out. Ref's distracted. Boom. Hangman eats a bunch of jewels off of that crown. But it's not that that puts him away. It's that move. Yeah. I thought that was great. Um, Swerve also sells the buckshot very well, you know. And, you know, that's another thing. They gave these these guys like promo time and like a like a build up. Even if it wasn't a lot, they gave him a lot. And um, Swerve, I really loved uh, a lot of what he was saying in in that contract signing. Like I really liked the line, "What's a kill shot to a buck shot?" And uh, I people, I don't know why the crowd didn't react as well when Hangman was literally talking about. He was talking about you know there was this cloud over my head, there was a cloud over my head, and uh, Swerve tells him, I hope you know it rains a lot in Seattle. Dang. You know? So I was like, I, the, the crowd barely reacted to it. I was like, that is, and he, Swerve, this is how that good he poetry. is. Yeah, this is how good Swerve is at promos. He knew that was a promo any line because he, he didn't say a word after that. You know, like that was to close the promo. Just, you know, it's it rains a lot in Seattle, so you better be ready. And like, the crowd barely reacted and caught it. I was like, that was such a perfect line. So we've seen, Jack, you and me, we've seen lots of guys, like, complain, like, make it their character motivation that they're not getting a shot, they're not getting their chance, right? But I loved Swerve's approach to demand not just a shot or a chance, but the shot and chance that Hangman got and that he seemingly didn't want right or deserve he's just outright said that so like i don't know there's it's a twist that's incredible he's like i want the shot you don't even want good and and the implications of this match jack if if he wins he beat a former aew heavyweight champion yeah and you know again it uh, i'm gonna say again aew is very overprotective of a lot of their stars they don't book a lot of them in you know singles matches a lot of times they don't book them in one-on-one matches a lot of times i mean you and i were very vocal about you know kenny being iwgp us champion and not defending it you know like he had the defense against jeff cobb on AEW tv but it's like we could have seen him defend it against you know a guy or you know not even think talking about the iwgp us championship just focusing on the feuds the elite found themselves in. They were feuding with House of Black heading into Revolution. We didn't get any singles matches there. We could have seen Kenny versus a guy like Brody King one-on-one versus Malachi Black. Feuding with the BCC, we didn't see Kenny go one-on-one with a guy like Claudio Castagnoli, you know? So it's like, they're very protective. And yet, you know, I know a lot of people are going to be like, oh, but, you know, Kenny's lost this many matches on pay-per-view. And it's like, yeah, but... A lot of them are tag matches, you know, or multi-man matches. And also, it's like, you know, they're being too uh, conservative in the fact of like, oh, we got to save these matches for the right time for pay-per-view. You don't have that time. I mean, we, you know, move. Uh, it's the uh, later in the show, but we're lucky to get Brian Danielson versus um, Zack Sabre Jr. We, we almost missed out on it. The first time due to injury, you know, and it's like, we're lucky to get it now, but, you know, there's a, there is a reality where we don't get that match because they wait too long to do it, you know? And it's like, that's why I like this match so much where it's like, it's two, it's a guy that could easily be positioned to the top. It's a guy who's a former AEW world champion, 
and they just go right ahead and say, let's go with this match, you know. And like I said, whoever loses, that's up to the booker to figure out where they go from there, you know. Right. I'm very interested. And you know what? This, you know, goes a long way to keeping me interested. I'm very interested to see where we go from here. Yeah. Uh, Given that he's already feuding with, like, Jay White, I think we maybe see MJF versus Jay White at uh, Full Gear. And I'll put it out there right now. Um, If they do an Eliminator tournament like they usually do, Ah. I need Swerve Strickland to win that tournament and face MJF at Winter is Coming. Ooh. I think, like I said, I think that could be not only an interesting matchup, but, you know, it can really see an uh, interesting dynamic with, you know, how is MJF going to play the uh, the babyface role? Because I don't think Swerve's going to be playing any uh, babyface role, you know? Yeah. That guy's a, unless you're in Seattle, that guy's a certified heel uh, everywhere. Goodness. How much time we got left in this episode? We have three minutes and 50 seconds. And five matches left to talk about. Yeah. So we'll close out on this episode thank you, saying thank you for joining for this one. Tune into part two where we cover the rest of the five matches that include Ricky Starks versus Wheeler Yuta, Brian Danielson versus Zack Sabre Jr., the Don Callis family versus Chris Jericho, Kenny Omega, and Kota Ibushi. Um, FTR versus Aussie Open for the AEW Tag Titles, and the main event being Christian Cage versus Darby Allen, two out of three falls for the TNT Championship.